Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Mina Jane. I am the um, of one of the programming librarians at the Cary Memorial Library, and I'm so excited to have Penny Reed and Julia Kent Hi. here. We are going to have a fabulous time. Um, just a couple of things before we get started is um, one is that we are recording and we are live on Facebook. If you can't get into the meeting for some reason, well, you're here, so I won't go into that. <laughs> um, you can buy signed books from Julia and Penny on their websites. Um, the links are on our program description. I sent it out this morning as well. And um, you know, signed books are gold, holidays are coming up, so keep a lookout. Um, I always like to thank our Cary Library Foundation for supporting all of our adult programming. And um, you know, so anybody who makes donations to the foundation helps bring programs like this to you. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start doing some introductions, which I always enjoy doing. Let's start with Penny. Penny Reed is a New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and USA Today bestselling author of the Winston Brothers, you know them, <laughs> Knitting <laughs> the City, Rugby, and Hypotheses series. She used to spend her days writing federal grant proposals as a biomedical researcher, but now she just writes books. Just, it should be in quotes. Oh. <laughs> She's also a full-time mom to three small adults, diminutive, I wanted, it's, it says, but um, I had trouble with that word. She's a wife, a daughter, a knitter, a crocheter, a sewer, not a sewer, general crafter, <laughs> <laughs> and thought ninja. <laughs> and I'm really pleased to meet her. I, I'm expecting we'll have so much fun today. Yeah, um, thank you so much for having me. So Julia Kent is a best-selling New York Times and USA Today author. Julia writes romantic comedy with an edge. Since 2013, she has sold more than 15, no, 1.5, is it 15 or 1.5? Oh, oh uh, 1.5. 1.5 million <laughs> books with four New York Times bestsellers and more than 16 appearances on the USA Today bestseller list. Her books have been translated into French and German and more titles are coming out every day. From billionaires to BBWs, I'm not sure what that is. Oh, big, um, beautiful women. A big, beautiful women. Okay, I love that. To new adult rock stars, Julia finds a sensual, goofy joy in every contemporary romance she writes. Unlike Shannon from Shopping for a Billionaire, she did not meet her husband after dropping her phone in a men's toilet. And he isn't, he isn't a billionaire either. You all know Clark. <laughs> so I would like to welcome Julia and Penny to Cary Library and um, uh, start with a question. So, and you guys can ask questions through the Q&A and use the chat for um, comments and um, tech issues that I can, I can take care of. And same with Facebook, please ask questions. I'll be paying attention over there. Um, <laughs> okay, so my question is, um, how did you guys meet? And I, the reason I asked this question is because when I, I met Julia a, year, a few years ago, and um, I just love her. I think you're amazing and funny and kind. And um, you have this really great voice, too. So I'm really, like, both in writing and your real voice. So I think that, um, you know, like, when we started talking about doing this last year, and you said, oh, I know Penny Reed, and everybody in the room sort of went, <gasps> <laughs> and they, they did. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you were friends. And I was just like, how did you guys meet? Because you just seem like, of course you're going to meet. You're, you're like, you look, seem like soul sisters. Well, I, I actually remember how we met. Um, it was in Seattle, right? It was in Seattle. And yeah. um, Daisy Prescott introduced us. That's and right. we were the signing in Seattle. And yes. um, that's how we first met. And, and then we went out to, um, we went out to breakfast. dinner. And, oh, we went, went out to dinner. dinner. Yeah. And then the next day when Lorraine, when LH Causeway arrived we had coffee too yes at that and funky place with that loft thing and that yes had, oh it was like super seattle like like seattle yeah. on on well not on steroids <laughs> but you know um that was seattle really on caffeine maybe. that like that like met my you know like like made my individualization heart fairly happy like i love the uniqueness of it yeah um, and then the thing that i this is going to sound terrible but the thing that i actually remember the most about that um encounter was that we we saw a, a dog and it, the dog was super cute. I don't know if you remember this, but the dog really liked you, right? So I am naturally distrustful of people, of oh. humans, of humans. And so um, the dog was walking down the street, you know, mm -hmm. 
there are more dogs in Seattle than there are children. I don't know if people know that. But <laughs> that. That's a true fact. There are more <laughs> dogs in Seattle than humans under the age of 18. So we were walking down the street and there was this really cute dog. And the dog was, you know, kind of shy or whatever. But then it came right over to you and wagged its tail. And I was like, the dog knows. So... Yeah, so then I was like, okay, yeah, I'm open to being her friend because the dogs like her. So anyway, I don't know. I don't think I've ever told you that. Before. I didn't know that story. That's so sweet. That was the oh. So I'm glad I secretly fed that dog before. Like, yes. like I had like a whole arrangement with the owner around the yeah. block. You know what? I've just given people like my Achilles uh, heel type of thing where now if people want me to trust them, all they have to do is set something up with a dog. So... <laughs> I'm gonna have to find another test. Maybe that's the actually, test. That's a meet cute right there for a rom com. Oh, you to just get the woman or the man to trust them. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. set something up with the dog. That's mm -hmm. super sneaky. There's like a Craigslist dog matchmaker company dude yes. woman something like that. Yes. It's yeah, like, or like loans children to guys. Oh, this is Oh, just oh. <laughs> <laughs> you just took it up a level. Like, boom. There we went. Just straight for it. What's next? Like, grandma? <laughs> Helping the lady, like, saving the old lady as she crosses the street. So There's it's a company that does that. But it's, like, run by ex-tech tech bros or something like that who need to be taught a lesson. Or, or, or former academics. Former which we are both. Which we are so, both. Maybe it's run by women. That would be an interesting twist. That would that would be. Be. Sorry, we haven't actually. Here we go. So this is like, <laughs> like plotting with Julia and Penny, like out well, of nowhere. <laughs> this is basically it's, what it's, it's like. It's really funny because people are like, genius at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, now we're going to get the email. Write this book. <laughs> That's right. And uh, Elizabeth on Facebook says yes you two with daisy would be a, a signing worth going to oh that would be fun oh. that would be good you guys need to fly out here though i'm not going to new england why well, beautiful here well for reasons the reason okay. being that it's it's actually not specifically new england it's like anywhere yeah i have this like well i guess you can't fly out either never mind well so we'll just have to like five years from now we'll We'll all be in our hamster bubbles and we'll just go across the country and meet in Denver or something like that. <laughs> oh, I like that. Hamster, Denver bubble. Is beautiful. hamster bubble RVs. Like, you know, that would That's be about, cute. <laughs> we have about 100 people um, uh, <laughs> in Facebook and here that are like, yep, we'll meet you in Denver. <laughs> we'll meet you in Denver. <laughs> what, did you hear what happened to Denver? No. I think Denver where they were like 90 degrees on Sunday and then there were 37 degrees. No. Was that no. Denver? It's well yeah. some part of Colorado that was going through that because my father lives in Colorado and I was like oh oh this is not That's a not good okay. mix. So. Okay mother nature is pissed off. So. <laughs> well and I thought New England was bad for weather. I thought you were going to say you didn't want to come to New England because of the weather. No no it's specifically the you know the thing that's happening right now. The Pandemic that shall not be named. So, uh, so um, more coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to ask a question. I mean, this is sort of like a, a general question from a couple of questions that have come through from Diane and from um, Elizabeth. Is like, where did you get the ideas for your? I'm going to say your first stories, and then we can go into more specifics. Like when I was nine. I was just. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I wrote a that comic was, book when I was nine. That involved a dog. How <laughs> <laughs> would well, you first publish stories? Girl oh, Scouts, fun. probably Girl Scout, <laughs> stealing Girl Scout cookies and eating them all in the closet and then feeling guilty and using paper root money to pay the bill. That probably was my, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, so well, you, actually, you had me a it. closet, to be honest. Um, <laughs> closet cookie eater. Um, closet cookie eater. I'm a seller cookie eater, but don't tell anybody in my house. Um, so for where, where did I get? Yeah, Diane actually asks um, Julia specifically for Smarty oh, Pants. Sure. And, and um, Elizabeth asks uh, Penny for the Winston Brothers. So that's why I was thinking earlier books. Oh, okay. Wait, for, 
for mine, what, what specifically? Smarty Pants? Oh, That's wait, pending. will we see a Smarty Pants story in the future? From, from me? So, yeah. Or from Penny? From you, oh, Julia. Not, not in the plans. No, I don't think we've talked about we've that. We've never talked about it. No, mm -hmm. well, we haven't talked about that's not in the plans, but it would always, but it separately from Smarty Pants Romance, it, if any of you want to pressure Julia into writing a book with Penny Reed, I'm not going to say that I am um, gave you that idea, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that would be fun. I think that would be fun. That would be fun. Um, so where did yeah. I get the, the Winston Brothers was just that I visited um, my parents' place in Tennessee on the on, in East Tennessee near uh, Cades Cove in the Smoky Mountains and I went to a jam session and um, at a community center that used to be an elementary school and they had uh, like a bluegrass room and a gospel room and a country western room and like a Texas country room and all that other kind of stuff and then they had like a learning room and some of the conversations I heard that were going on in the rooms were really funny like there were these two ladies who were talking about well i wanted to get a cat but she wanted 15 dollars for the cat i'm not paying 15 dollars for a cat and so it was like you know just like those real life but absurd conversations and so i started writing down some of the conversations that people were having and so that's where it was born was the jam session in um in uh tennessee so there you go so rhonda on facebook says Julia, please tell us your first story when you were nine. <laughs> uh, it probably involved a closet cookie eater. It probably <laughs> involved Tagalogs or uh, Thin Mints, which I can't eat anymore because I'm now gluten free. But in 1979, I wasn't. Um, no, I actually, um, I'm trying to think. The first story um the first the, like the first real short story that i wrote um other than something when i was nine or ten but like where i studied short stories and it was english class um not 11th grade because that was all moby dick and you know native son and deep intense you know lit crit but we had to write an actual fiction short story in ap english in 12th grade and i remember feeling unleashed like, oh, this is awesome. I'm going to write like the best. I wrote this creepy Santa story. <laughs> it was like the little girl who snuck down to look at her presents. And then like the creepy Santa shows up and he's got like, it, it was, it was, I, I was a Stephen King fan at the time. And I, I had a, a English teacher who was on his final year of teaching after like 34 years of teaching teenagers. And he just wrote, this is creepy, A. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> nice. Um, so Giselle wants to know, how do you do co-writing collaboration? Do you take a chapter and then send it to each other? Do you have a shared drive? What do you do? So Julia, who do you co-write with? So I co have co-written with or co-write with um, Elisa Reed and with I I'm half of the duo of Diana Sear, which is um, my friend Gretchen Galway that we're open about this. Um, so we co-write differently for each one. Um, and I know you co-write with LH Causeway. Yeah. And um, so we, it, in our case, it's generally one of us picks one POV, one picks the other. But if one, so I generally write the male POV. Uh, that's not all, always true. But if I have like a runaway idea, then I'll just write the female POV too, or vice versa. Um, that's how we do it. Yeah, that's how we do it too. Yeah. And then as we send the chapters back and forth, she'll edit the chapter I just wrote from, if I'm writing the male POV, she'll edit that and then write the next chapter. Then I'll edit her chapter and write the next chapter. Because sometimes you need a little course correction because you have an idea for the next chapter. Yes. And so, but um, yeah. Our, Writing books with L.H. Causeway has been an absolute joy. She's fantastic. She's a great writer. As yeah, co-writing, cool it's really fun. But what I like about it is you, there's, there's, it's not one upmanship. Is that the right word? It, it, but it's like you leave, like it inspires me to write just to level up yeah. just slightly. Yeah. And sometimes I just stare in awe at the screen and go, oh, I got nothing. I got nothing. <laughs> no, you, you just, this is superb. 
Yeah. I, I'd like to know, how do you end up with, a, with somebody you co-write a book with? Like, do they ask you? Do you is it somebody you're really interested in? Is it something the publisher does? Um, you get on a, on a Zoom call with Julia Kitt. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what you do is, uh, in, my, in my case with LH Causeway, we met at a signing in Edinburgh in 2014 or I think I want to say it was 2014. And um, I was a late addition to that signing and she was going already. And um, our, our books had appeared in, at the end of 2013 on a bunch of lists together. And it was either her book was number one and mine was number two, or my book was number one and her book was number two. So independently of ever talking to each other, we were both like, I guess we need to read this book. Um, so because they were paired together so frequently. So I read her book, which was Painted Faces. And if you have not read Painted Faces, then you, your life is not complete. Hey, you've read it, right? I have. Really? Oh my gosh, yeah. it's such an amazing book. Anyway, so I read it and I was like, how did my book ever get a number one spot if this book <laughs> exists? Because it was so great. I mean, her, it was such a fantastic book. Because so your book is great too. Oh no, but Painted Faces is like, it's like a sentinel work, I feel like in romance. And if anybody's teaching a course on like a college course on romance writing, they need to put Painted Faces on the syllabus because it just completely, it's a, it's just a, I hate to use the, again, tech bro wording, but it's a paradigm shift. It's like, it changes the way you think about yourself and the world and all of this. Anyway, so it's an important book, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and so I reached out to her because I saw she was going to, and now the story has officially become too long, I'm sorry. But um, I reached out to her because I saw she was going to the same signing and I said, hey, my name is Penny Reed and I'm going to this signing. And she goes, oh, I know who you are. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, let's have coffee together. Well, so we met for coffee when they lost my luggage. So I was, it was gross. Anyway, so I, was, I, I met her for coffee and then we just ended up spending the next 48 hours together. And over the course of that 48 hours, I told her that I'd always wanted to write a book about a woman who tears apart male celebrities in the same way that female celebrity or female celebrities have been torn apart by the media. You know how like women, remember those shows like best and worst dressed or like mm -hmm. they, they have the picture and they have like the circle of, Oh, look at how dare she have a panty line or whatever. So I'd always <laughs> wanted to write a, a female blogger who does that, but only exclusively to male celebrities. And, um, she was like, I'll write that book with you. And then like one of the male celebrities, of course, becomes super angry and starts sending her like angry e emails about that. So that's how the book started. But yeah, so that was that. was that. Sorry, that was long. Julia, take it away. Oh, uh, so the co-authoring with Gretchen Galway, we just, it involved a bottle of vodka and um, a novelist's conference. <laughs> and it was, <laughs> it sounds, that's kind of the short, version. Uh, it was basically, you know, we should write something together. We should write shifters. We should write billionaire shifters. We should write billionaire shifters who have an elongated lifespan and who fall in love with humans. Six uh -huh. books later, um, we did. So that's, and then Elisa and I, she came to me. So Elisa is my editor um, and has edited uh, all of the shopping series books. And she came to me at one point and said, uh, there's this little scene in, uh, I think it's Shopping for a CEO, the seventh book, um, where they are mystery shopping. So the shopping series is Shopping for a Billionaire and it's mystery shopper meets billionaire while she's mystery shopping in one of the stores. And mystery shoppers are people who pretend to be customers in stores and they're secretly doing customer service evaluation and writing up reports. So they mystery shop a women's spa that is the fourth space for women. And it's this like lifestyle, high-end spa slash, I don't know, haven. And Elisa said, I think you should do a spinoff series. And here's the first couple thousand words of your spinoff series, <laughs> like, basically. 
and she's shyer than that, but that was the, the essence of it. And I took a look and said, oh, wow, uh, okay, let's see what happens. And we've written two and part of a third book, but uh, life has kind of gotten complicated in lots of ways. And so things are, are essentially on hold for that, which that's called the on hold series. So, ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so apropos. <laughs> Uh, Michelle wants to know, how do your characters come to you to get their stories written? Um, Penny. Uh, so, I have some characters who are like really loud and never go away. And then I have some characters who are really quiet and I have to force them to talk to me. Um, but I honestly hear voices in my head and I don't know if I should admit that just in case I ever, my sanity is ever called into question, but I do, I hear different voices in my head. Um, and yeah, so that's how they come to me is like, whichever voice is loudest tends to be whatever book I'm writing or, and then I know I can take that as a cue that, that the next book needs to be the voice that's uh, starting to be louder. So yeah, that's, I mean, that's basically it. And then I honestly, Sometimes I, I want to take the story in a certain direction and the character doesn't want me to. And I have learned over the course of all my books that I don't ever get to decide how the story goes. That's, um, that's entirely up to the characters. Because if I try to take it in the way I want to take it, then they'll stop talking to me or they'll start cussing me out or something like that. <laughs> and it doesn't work out well. So. Julia? Um, so... I see my books as one big movie in my head. Um, and except that I get like the director's pieces of scenes kind of thrown at me at, a at one at a time. I don't see it as one long, like when I'm done with a book, I finally go, oh, this is the two hour and 15 minute version I see of the movie. But no, I get seven minutes at the end and 14 minutes here and and I have to kind of piece it together. And I used to say that it was like more like a paint by numbers and like the little greens would come out first and then the pinks would come out first. And then like I would get to about 20%, 15% of the whole picture and then it would just suddenly go whoo, all the color. Um, and both are, are pretty close. So I don't, I don't hear the characters. It's more like I see them. So sometimes when I write, I have to close my eyes and I, I'm kind of like there. Um, and then when I, it's great because I'm omniscient, so they just all freeze when I'm not writing them, <clears throat> which is really great. But when they really demand attention, then they start like banging on the pretend screen. Like, Let us out, do stuff like that. So, so um, Leslie on Facebook would like to know um, when the next random series book will be coming out. <laughs> I just published one <laughs> three weeks ago, <laughs> which is, <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Um, yeah, the 11th one just came out. Um, it, there will be more. Um, you know, I took almost two years off from the shopping series. And so there's a new one. Actually, there are two new ones uh, coming by the end of 2020. So one is in October, one's in December. I, the December one hasn't been announced, but that is 95% sure. Just haven't announced a day. Um, but random, it's when those characters start banging on the window, you know? Um, that The last one was pretty intense to write um, and fun. And, um, you know, and, and to kind of go off just slightly, um, on a, it's not a tangent, but writing right now is, um, it's, it's in meaning right now, given world events, is interesting because I can write. It's not a problem writing. Um, it's more that I have a lot of convergence going on in my personal life and health and kids and family health and all of that. So what I write kind of depends even more on where my headspace is and where my heart is than it, it used to. It used to be um, in some ways easier 
And so now it's more like, okay, I have this space, what's coming forth. And um, so having that space is different now than it was six, seven, eight months ago. So, but there is going to be more random. That was not the last book. I will always warn people when the last book is coming and that wasn't the last book. So, so we can plan on our morning, right? Like how, how we're going to grieve. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Leslie did follow that up with, she knows because she finished it already. <laughs> she's for the next one. <laughs> so, uh, but I totally hear you on not being able to do the things that you expect to be able to do during these times. Um, Jennifer um, would, ask, would like to ask Penny, do you have a personal connection with the Southern experience? You don't sound like you're from the South, but the setting and colloquialisms are spot on and so entertaining. So I was uh, raised in Florida and uh, in this small town in Florida. And I feel like in the South, even though Florida is not really the South, I mean, Northern Florida is the South, but Central and South Florida isn't really considered the South. I don't think so. Although some, I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but the small town politics, and I, are, I think they're the same in every Southern town, the same kind of dynamics. You, you find the same characters, you know, there's always, there's like the dog walk or the dog collect, somebody's trying to get into my bedroom. This will be interesting. I don't know which of my children it is. Oh, it's my youngest, and she doesn't have any clothes on. <laughs> it's not that kind of program. Go well, find your dad. Okay. She took that well. Anyway, so, um, yeah, but those kind of colloquial, colloquialisms, uh, they are, they're consistent, I think, in the South, that the same kind of, uh, the catchphrases and the oh well bless your heart and so I don't sound like I'm from the south but everybody I went to high school with does sound like they're do, does have those the what you would expect in terms of the southern twang and all of that but um no I, I I never I never had it I'm not really sure why because two of my siblings picked it up and the other one didn't I have there's four of us uh, but I didn't pick it up so I'm not really sure why and sometimes I do say y'all though and in Seattle that gets me weird looks, but I think it's so efficient and it's gender neutral and it it's inclusive. So I just like it as a pronoun, y'all. It works for so much. Um, <laughs> I, lo I, I love this comment in, um, in the chat from Kim. I'm such a Penny Reed nerd. I want to make a timeline of all the Winston Brothers books and the Smarty Pants romance books. Oh, we actually have that. We have that in our wiki. Um, we have a wiki. A wiki. So Wikipedia, but for the Smarty Pants Romance books relative to the, the Pennyverse is what it's called. And um, we have that timeline. I'm sure, I think we've actually shared it in our Patreon account. Um, we shared like, so we have our, our cup runneth over with content and I didn't want to bombard all of my readers with maybe content that they weren't interested in. So we created a Patreon account for that kind of stuff. So we have like character sheets on there which go over the details of you know like the Winston Brothers characters and then the timelines and uh detail specifics on like Jeannie's country western bar etc cetera, etc cetera. so um sometimes you do that oh and somebody just posted that it's on Facebook also I'm not sure if I think the Winston Brothers timeline is on Facebook but I don't think the Smarty Pants Romance books are included in that but yeah so I think we have that on Patreon just FYI heads up Sorry, it's raining like crazy here now. So I'm gonna have to go open, close the window in a second. But okay. Penny, so if you have the chat open, can you put the wiki website on in the chat? No, I can't. It's behind a, it's, it has uh, spoilers in it. So we can't share it uh, externally facing. Uh, that's why we do screenshots and share them on as JPEGs on the, um, on the uh, Patreon account. Got it, okay. So this next question is for you both, and it actually ties into a question on Facebook. B. Irwin wants to know, are you a pantser, a plotter, or both? <laughs> and Rhonda on Facebook says, it sounds like neither of you write linear, linearly. linearly. <laughs> Do you have to keep those pieces, these pieces in a journal? Are you able to remember all the details as you work on new projects? 
What do you say, Julia? Oh, I'm like totally a pantser, like totally a pantser. I've, um, well, with a few exceptions, but I'm, <clears throat> um, and of course that means, therefore, I'm not totally a <laughs> pantser. Um, <clears throat> I, I drive my editors nuts um, because I write out of order. And so that introduces a lot of errors and timeline issues and no, she's not really 17 months pregnant, that kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but, but no, I'm definitely 95% pantser. So I'm 95% plotter. I've only, but- A little Venn diagram. A little, yeah. Little. But when I, um, I super plot, like I plot books, I write in series, so I write, I write, um, I plot them out so that I can do the Easter eggs in the earlier books and then carry it through and that kind of stuff and have hints. I love hints. Um, but because then for my, I, I've always enjoyed like in the Harry Potter books when you read those, you go back and you pick up on yes. things that she, so, um, so except for two books in every once in a while, I give myself permission to just pants it. And so I've done that with the two books we, uh, that I wrote for charity, the Kissing Tolstoy and the Kissing mm -hmm. Galileo. Those are 100% pantsed. And not just that, but I would write the chapter before. So I released them via my newsletter first. Mm -hmm. And so I'd write it like fanfic, where I would, I would write a chapter at a time, a chapter a month, right before it was supposed to go into the newsletter. So it wasn't edited. It wasn't anything. That's so fun, though. It was, so fun. it was a lot of fun to do because I was like, where are we going today? You know, like that. So that was good for, I think, my writer brain was to take a break and do that. So if those stories don't make sense, that's probably why, because I'm not used to writing books. So what was the other question, Julia? Um, question? Not if you, if you don't, if do you, if you don't write linearly. <laughs> oh, linear, linearly. Yes. I do don't. you keep a notebook or anything like that? So since I plot so much, I know exactly what is going to happen. So a lot of times I do write mostly linearly, uh, but sometimes I'll skip over a scene if I don't want to write it. And then I have to go back and write it later. And that's always the worst. So, and that's why I'll never not drink alcohol. <laughs> you do know this is being recorded, right? I know. So I mentioned the vodka. Now you've got the... <laughs> Oops. But it's like when you got, it's like, um, I figure in terms of self medication, a little bit of red wine is okay. And so every, I mean, don't, don't quote me in a lawsuit or anything, but um, I, it, when you have to write those things, you really don't want to write, you need a little bit of mental lubrication <laughs> to get things moving. And so for me, it happens to be red wine. Well, I've cut my coffee consumption down from eight double shots a day down to two. And so, Congratulations. so I used to, I used to be the epitome of the writer who converted caffeine into words. Um, but, but now there's that single glass of white wine. For me, it's white wine. But yeah. yeah. No, I don't write linearly at all. It, uh, I write emotionally linearly though, hmm. but not action linearly so i know i know the emotional journey that my oh that okay. my characters need to make and i know exactly what emotional pivots they need to make um at a given time but how they do that is not in my head until i sit down to write it interesting um, I've had a bunch of questions asking and, and julia you already started answering this is if you've been able to write more or less during covid um, it's technically less. Um, the writing is not hard for me and I'm feeling really uh, blessed with that because I know that it's very hard for some folks, um, for some writers. Uh, for me, I just have so little time and I've been very public about some of the personal stuff that's going on in our life. My husband's having a, an endothelial cell transplant, which is um, uh, similar to, it's, it's one step before a corneal transplant in his eye because he is going blind. He's losing his sight. And so COVID complicated all of that tremendously. And so that's literally happening in the next two weeks. Uh, we 
<laughs> hope. Um, and I have, I am suddenly homeschooling an 11 year old with special needs and dealing with a whole bunch of other stuff that uh, lots of parents, the, the people who are caring for family members, people who are living their lives and dealing with stuff are dealing with. So for me, um, I'm writing technically less because I have less time to write, but, um, um, but if I had more time, I would probably be writing the same or more because the writing has become a haven. That's great. For me. I think the reading has become a haven for a lot of people as well. I also discovered Lucifer on Netflix, <laughs> which is my new show. <laughs> so that's how I, I'm, I'm not, it's funny because I'm reading because uh, we all start out as readers, right? Um, I'm reading more, but I'm also finding myself um, seeking out more escapist mm -hmm. fiction or escapist shows. And that one is so over the top that it's just, boom, hilarious. So. Okay. Penny. <laughs> oh. Um, I'm teasing. I, <laughs> I was, uh, I um, made the mistake of, I want to say it's a mistake. I made a uh, judgment that was an error, which was that um, I was going to be writing this very personal book <laughs> prior to our current situation. And I had gotten, I had started writing it. And um, this is all to say that was uh, not a good match for our current situation in the world. And so recently I have uh, given myself permission to pause writing that book and to instead write something completely different in um, new and um, slapsticky and silly and escapist. And so I just started writing that after struggling to get words on the page for, I don't know, like since March. Um, I just started writing that last week and it's actually going well. So that's very exciting. But prior to that point, I mean, I was lucky if I got a thousand words a week. So that's not good. That's for like my typical output was something closer to an average of three to 5,000 words a day. And so wheels were just not, it just wasn't happening. And I refuse to drink any more red wine to make it happen. So that's my healthy choice. <laughs> so yeah, so just switching gears sometimes, trying something new, that'll make a, that makes a big difference. Well, you guys are both pretty prolific. So we're so lucky to get so many books from you. So a little bit of a break is, uh, <laughs> is allowed. Um, so Julia, Melanie and Kristen both want to know, well, when is your next Melly, Ra Melly Rain book coming out? I love how they intertwine. And Kristen says, I didn't sleep for two weeks while consuming the Melly Rain books. Any more coming in the future? Uh, yes, but it'll be a while. So that's one of the most interesting parts about uh, the current situation is that my brain can write rom-com, my brain can write other things, um, my brain can't write the intense rom suspense that Melly Rain is because for those who don't know I also write as Melly Rain and Melly Rain writes these super intense romant romantic suspense um, books that could not be more different. It's like the yin yang, my evil brain gets to turn on uh, for those books. And right now the bandwidth for that just isn't there. It's not that I'll never write those again. I actually have two more that plotted out to the extent. So, so this is the 5% plotter. So, so <laughs> when you write a mystery or a, and you, you know this cause you've just I published one and you're working on yeah. the other one. Um, now <laughs> Melly Rain is as far from cozy mystery or anything like that as you can get. Um, I mean, I have, I, oh, I do really horrible things to my poor characters. My husband reads all my books first. And so I'll hear him shouting and he'll come in and he'll <laughs> slap the manuscript on the table. He'll go, you're so cruel. Um, <laughs> and then I know I've done a good job. Um, but it, it, for now, I don't, I, I've started, I started the next, um, the next one, but had to pause it. So it, yes, there'll be more because I do have two really, really, really intense, loose continuations of the story. I mean, a lot of the story was wrapped up, but, but not um, in the stateless 
trilogy that came out last year. So thank you. Um, I, I do need to, um, you know, maybe stretch those muscles a little bit sometime in October, November when I have a little more bandwidth, but, but yeah. I do want to let you know that um, Facebook sort of blew up a little bit when you said Lucifer. Everybody's like, Lucifer, <laughs> we love it. Okay, so I'm going to tell the Lucifer story. I'll try to be quick. I, I have, it turns out I have something called slipping ribs syndrome. I slipped a bunch of ribs on my right side, thought I had, had hurt my shoulder, but it turns out my ribs were out of joint. Oh. Yeah, that was a couple, about three or four weeks ago. And, I remember that, yeah. Yeah. And so I am not the veg out on the couch and just binge watch TV person at all. I'm the opposite. And so I ended up just sitting on the couch, no brain function, in a lot of pain. And someone had told me about Lucifer. Actually, uh, uh, my project manager, Maria, had told me about Lucifer. So I popped it up and watched five episodes in a row to the point where my kids were like, what's wrong with mom? Is she okay? She never does this. Is she okay? And I was like, come watch this show with me. So anyhow, that's, that's, and now I'm addicted to it and it's hilarious. It's a police procedural where, well, the devil comes down to earth and goes to LA to play and he ends up solving crimes with a female cop. I mean. I heard it's fantastic. I am right so there. Great. It's on my it's, list. Like the fact that I can just describe it in a sentence tells you how great it is. Like, that's it. I wish I could learn to describe my books in one sentence. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't actually remember what the question was. Do you? Oh, you please? were just mentioning that on Facebook, it blew up when she mentioned Lucifer. Okay. So should I move on to the next question? That then? would make sense to me. Okay. I mean, you guys can continue chatting no, too. No, no, you're great. You're so <laughs> Okay, so I have a couple of really interesting questions about publishing, and I and I picked these because um, I know uh, Julia is one of the you're self-published for the, you know, and you started your own publishing arm, you know. So I think that that's fascinating. Um, so on Facebook, Christina asks, "What is your process of choosing a narrator for your audiobook? And on um, Zoom, Giselle asks, for your characters, does their voice come first or do they have physical form? And how much does that impact your cover choice? So that's curious to me. How much do you have to say of the covers? How much do you have to say about um, narrators for your audiobooks? And since you're self-publishing, Julie, is that different from traditional publishing, um, Penny? Well, Penny self-publishes too. So we both, oh. we both do. Um, yeah. Okay, well, let's, I'm going to delete that entire part of the recording. <laughs> <laughs> For some of the reason, I thought you were traditionally published. But um, so anyways, how, let, let's answer that question without worrying about the traditional okay. public publishing. Do you want to take the narrator part first? Penny? Oh, sure. So, um, so in, what I used to do is there's this uh, website called ACX, which is the audiobook exchange. And so when I first started writing my books and deciding that I wanted to do audiobooks, um, I went to the audiobook exchange on ACX and I looked for, uh, usually the book was already written. So I started looking for characters. I started, you can search by criteria. So uh, what is the age of the character? What is the narration type? Is it engaging? Is it comedic? Or, you know, is it serious? Is it suspenseful? And so, um, and then also, is there an accent? And so then I think just recently they added, um, they added some additional demographic information, such as what is the character's eth ethnicity or cultural group, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have more specificity when you search. Um, so I would go on there and I would, you know, do a search for the character traits that I thought matched. And then I would get a bunch of people who, and then I would go through and listen to the, cause they would have um, audition reels on ACX. And then I would find somebody who I thought was a good match or maybe five people. And then I would email them and at, or through the system and ask them to audition. And then once I'd go through the auditions, I'd pick my person and then there you go. And then they would, um, they would record it, edit it, master it, send it to me. We would upload it. I would pay them. Everybody was happy. <laughs> um, more recently, I had a, well, I should say on ACX about last year, um, I started having a lot of problems with the narrators that I would find. 
And so I stopped using ACX after about four bad experiences with four separate narrators. And I just started using word of mouth from my author friends. So we have, um, and then also if it's a Winston Brothers book, I use Joy Nash and uh, Chris Brinkley for the Winston Brothers book. So that makes it much easier when you have a good team. Um, but Andy Arndt is a is an audiobook narrator, but she also runs her own. I don't know if I want to call it a product. Would you call it a production company? Production company, yeah. And so she has a bunch of narrators that work for her. So more and more recently, I've just been relying on her to help us find narrators for my projects, just because I know that they're going to actually get done and they're going to be professional and there's not going to be issues with them. And so that's become much more important to me as I've. Um, produce more and more audiobooks and I think my my tolerance level for that's okay I'll fix it or that's okay let's <laughs> you know it can be delayed two weeks my tolerance for that has greatly diminished and now it's I want it done I want it done on time I want it to be good I don't have mental <laughs> energy to, like you know hear about this so um so that's my process nowadays so what about you Julia uh, my process is almost identical. I started out with ACX and had the auditions and found some really amazing people. I got fortunate right off the bat with um, with the Shopping for Billionaire series. Tanya Eby who is just amazing. She's amazing. And yeah. Nailed Shannon. And actually, I learned about her through word of mouth from Gretchen Galway because she did Gretchen Galway's romantic comedies first. And then, um, but then I did some auditions for various people um, and then it went to word of mouth. And, and then now I work with Andy Arndt and her lyric audio books. And it's funny because for the longest time I waited to cast Darla um, in the random series and finally realized that I should just ask Andy, um, Andy. who is yeah. amazing and got uh, just a phenomenal performance from her and from the whole team from Sebastian York and Tad Branson for that series. Right. He's yeah. just, he's nobody narrates books like Sebastian York. And amazing. not just that, but he is a pleasure. He he is just an enjoyable person professional. He is and so he, exactly that's it. He you know that if you have him narrate your book, the files are going to either be done early or at the very latest on time. And they're all going to be excellent. And he always clean. questions clean, mm. so clean. And he, he adds to the, he takes my words and he elevates them. Yes. And so I yes. do start writing books just to have him narrate them. <laughs> do you do that? You I'm doing getting that? there. I am getting yeah. there. But I, when I'm writing things, I, I can envision his voice. Yeah. So I've got some things coming up where I'm like, okay, this is, this is, yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. I, want, I have that, that, um, the Jane Austen retellings where the, yes. the, the chromosomal arrangements are swapped. So it's Elizabeth is Eli and Darcy is uh, Darcy Williams, female angel investor. Yeah. And so I'm specifically hear his voice when I'm writing Eli. So the Elizabeth Bennett character. So he's gonna, he doesn't know this yet, but I'm gonna ask him to be <laughs> my Elizabeth Bennett or my Eli Bennett in the book. So I'm excited, but he's so great. And he's such a lovely person, consummate professional. Can't say enough positive things about Sebastian York. Just yeah. amazing. So I'm, I'm curious about like what people think in, um, in chat and on Facebook about having one narrator or two. Um, do you have a preference? Because when I started reading or listening to audio books, I thought having two narrators, like a male and female, the male would read all the male parts and the female would read all the female parts, but they actually read, most of the time, they just switch up chapters. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious about if other people find that they like that or they don't like that or and why yeah. and um also you like do you have a preference of having one or two i know you said penny you like having the team um i like to have so for the winston brothers in particular i chose chris brinkley because he 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 auditioned via uh acx but when i heard him i got chills because he sounded exactly like that voice in my head and I was a little freaked out about it and so then at one point I had to talk to him on the phone 
and I, it was not a good situation because it was like talking to my character and it's not okay that I hear voices already, but the fact that that voice was like talking to me on the phone. You and manifested him. I made him. <laughs> I made him. Anyway, um, yeah, so That's he's talking That was crazy. Um, I'm sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Just so you, if you have a preference, um, people are saying they love Chris Brinkley, that some people like having two, some people find it distracting. Um, well, I felt like Joy Nash was such a great fit. So she originally narrated for me the Beauty and the Mustache, which is the fourth book mm -hmm. in the Meeting in the City series, but it's the more or less the first book in the Winston series. Uh, it's about the Winston sister. And so she did Ashley's voice for me. And she has a master's degree, I think in, I forget what the exact title is, but basically linguistics. And she can do any accent. Um, and she sounds like, it, and when she does the male voice, she sounds like a man, but not like in the, oh, that's creepy. But like, I am, I have forgotten that she's not, that she's doing this voice. Like it becomes so natural. And so I really wanted her to do the Winston Brothers books. And then when I heard Chris, I just felt like, yeah, he has to do them. So that was my first experience doing both a male and a female narrator. Usually I would just do the female narrator and then she would do both roles. But after those, that first book, um, Truth or Beard turned out so well, I felt like it turned out well. Um, I, I started doing that more often, but I don't think I've had, I don't think I've departed from that since that, that book. How about you, Julia? Do you, did you always do male and female or did you? Um, so many of my books, uh, well, the books that I put into audio were single point of view. So if it was all female point of view, then I just had a female narrator. I've broken that once in a while. So like one of the books in my shopping series is male and female, but it was third person, which most of the series is first person. It's a long story. And so I just had Sebastian York do the whole thing. <laughs> I was like, here, take it. Um, but, you know, I, I, I've gotten feedback that people really like the male parts to be, or the male POV point of view parts to be done by a guy and the female point of view parts to be done by a woman. And now more and more people are doing what's called duet narration, which is where the male and the female, the, the two narrators are often in the studio together, although the pandemic makes that harder, um, but where the actual dialogue in a scene, even if it's the male point of view, is read by the female mm -hmm. and vice versa, so that speaking parts are done by the, you know, the female speaking parts are done by the female and male um, speaking parts done by the male. And that's its own thing. It's almost like a radio play. Um, but that I requires- I want to give that a try. I want to give that a try. Have you done that yet? I haven't done it. No, I had plans. Um, one of the few trad pub deals I did, um, one of my books was turned into a radio play. Um, and, but that's different because that has sound effects and that like a full radio play. So it wasn't just duet. Um, but I think that's a movement that I think there's more and more of the duet and of the full cast audio um, coming down the, you know, coming, coming into the field more. But the other thing is, as people who produce our own audio, the cost for that is significantly higher. And, um, and trying to coordinate even more people gets complicated and popular narrators book <laughs> six months, eight months, or this one might be in this, you know, busy doing, because a lot of narrators are actors as well. So they might be doing an actual acting job somewhere and not available. So, so it gets really complicated behind the scenes when you get more than two people involved in an audio production. A lot of people are saying they like duet, duet narration and the dual narrations and things like that. Mm -hmm. Your friend Maria, um, Julia, says she likes male narrators for male characters and female for female characters and full cast audio is great because it does seem like an old time radio show. Yeah. Um, I love this comment from Jennifer who says, I love having two narrators because I don't like hearing men speaking the female love scenes in falsetto. <laughs> I agree with that. I, I co-sign that comment. <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Um, okay, so the second part of that question was about covers. And now that I have oh. this clear that you both self-publish, um, so do you have more say in your covers, especially if you have a picture in your head? So I, I designed my own covers until just recently. So the Knitting in the City series, which was my first series, was recovered and author Stacy Hart did those covers for me. But all the other covers, so the Winston Brothers covers I've done myself in Hypothesis series, Rugby, those are all ones that I've made. So I have a lot of say in my covers. If I did my own covers, they would have a stick figure and comic <laughs> sans on them. You do not want to see what what my I can't read flow charts like I'm visually that like that part of the brain is is gone so um, I do have say in in who I hire um, you know most people who self-publish hire people who've worked for the large traditional publishing houses or people who never have but who have an eye and do really well um, so I, I have a say, but I have learned over the years to stop trying to control what's on the cover and to give the cover designer the emotion I'm going for. Um, the genre and the emotion. What is the thing, you know, someone smarter than me, and frankly, I don't remember who, <laughs> uh, years ago said a cover is a stop sign. It's just designed to get readers yeah. to know that like, bam, this is something I should at least read the description for because this may tickle my reading fancy right now. Um, or, or it's, a, it's a, a radioactive sign, do not <laughs> yeah. It right. can be used as both, so. That's a good point, good point, so. Oh, I do remember the, all those 80s covers. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so we're, we have a few more minutes, and um, this is a really fun question for both of you. Is there a character that is your ideal man that you've written? I'm going to let you think about that for a minute. Well, the character, so in the fifth book for the Knitting in the City series, um, the, it was about a married couple who'd been married 14 years, and the male character in that was based on my husband. Um, so I guess that character, because we get along really well. So I would probably say Greg from um, Ninja at First Sight and Happily Ever Ninja. Oh, Julia? Um, so there's a little, I always say there's a little bit of Clark in every single one of my heroes. Um, so like if one of my characters wears a baby in a sling or brings his wife water when she's breastfeeding at three in the morning and that's, that's, that's Clark. Um, but the closest I've ever gotten to Clark as a person um, is, is a dad <laughs> in one of my books. So I, and, and like Jason in the shopping series. Um, but I'm actually writing a book right now that um, I haven't talked about. I guess apparently I am. Um, it's about a female tuba teacher. Uh, I play tuba. And a guy who's going blind and has Fuchs dystrophy. Funny, that has nothing to do with real life at all. Um, and that character is a really strong version of my husband. And this, believe it or not, is a rom-com. Um, and so it's cathartic as can be. So when I say I'm writing, I'm writing stuff that, um, I'm writing this to kind of process some of what I'm going through and to give it a lighter feel. Um, so that particular character. But there's a fair amount of my husband in Declan uh, in my shopping for billionaire suit, not the billionaire part, I wish. But um, the, the ability to um, cut through bullshit really quickly and to know what he wants. And, um, and then in Jason in the shopping series, I always say that that character is a beta alpha, um, meaning there's no need to show that they're dominant. There's no need to, but, and just is perfectly content being who they are until you threaten or cross someone in their inner circle. And then bam, hmm. out comes the alpha. 
Okay. Um, so I, um, we, if you don't mind staying for a few more minutes, I have a bunch of more really good questions. Okay. Um, Julia, Judy wants to know, how do you research billionaires? <laughs> um, the same way I researched neoliberal economic policy and grape exports in Chile when I was a grad student um, in <laughs> policy history. <laughs> um, I go for the really dry stuff first and then I get into the really juicy stuff after because um, grape exports meant wine. See, we're back to wine. Um, but uh, I actually had to ask my accountant once can I write off some things that are related to billionaires, like like helicopter rides over Boston Harbor, or and I it was kind of an interesting conversation. I can't write off like a, a Kate Spade bag or any of those fun flashy things, but um, I research them by looking at articles, reading. Uh, I I now there there are some really in interesting Instagram feeds like Children of Billionaires. You can find, yeah oh yeah there's some interesting visual uh, status signaling out there on the internet that you can oh. read and look at to get a feel for things. Um, but I don't I don't personally know a billionaire, but I know a number of people who made piles of money in tech, um, and I can get a sense from that as well. Thank you. Um, Penny, Kristen wants to know, how do you pick your diverse characters? I always gain so much insight and empathy through reading your books. Um, I think that they, it goes back to the hearing of the voices in the head. So I think they pick me. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, I wonder sometimes if they're born out of I, I read a lot, so I don't read a lot of fiction, but I read a lot of nonfiction. So I read a lot of essays and news stories and um, or news sources and journal articles. And sometimes I'll read an, an essay or a, an article about a real person, and then that real person becomes a fictional person in my head. So um, for example, uh, the character of Matt, Simmons from Dating-ish, who is an AI uh, researcher. His, his, his psychology study that he's doing with Dr. Derek Merrick um, is about, and I like that name because it rhymes, uh, about uh, where they use the dating websites and they collate the data and they're looking for clusters of people who are very similar, et cetera, et cetera. It's a deception study. It's a psychological deception study. And what they're trying to do is create they were trying to redo, uh, they're trying to create that in, in their AI, in their artificial intelligence. They're trying to create a prototype of a female or a prototype of a male based on actual human behaviors. And so that was actually based on this mathematician in UCLA. I had read this article about him where he got access to the back end of several dating websites because he wasn't having any luck. He was doing like OkCupid, okay, et cetera, et cetera. And he wasn't having any, any luck finding, going, finding, he wanted to get married and he had no luck finding the woman he wanted to marry. So as a researcher, he contacted the dating websites. He's like, I'm a mathematician at UCLA and we're doing this, we're interested in your uh, aggregate data set, right? So it was de-identified. It just showed information like uh, so any de-identified data, so there's, you know, I think there's 19 direct identifiers. So they scraped it of all of that and they sent him the data set. And what he did was, when this was fascinating, he, and I think it's fascinating, but if I'm going too long, feel free to play the wrap up music. You have my permission. But what he did was he found in the if data. If you hear thing, REO Speedwagon, you know you're done. <laughs> okay, good. He found the women that he was interested in based on their preferences. And then he went backwards and found what kind of guys they were interested in. And then he created seven or five different profiles mimicking those interests. But he said he never lied. But what he did was he played up those things that those kinds of women were interested in. And so he had five different profiles 
focused on those particular, like one was a big into mountain climbing and that was what he really liked to do and mountain biking because that was something that the women were really interested in. And he did that already, but it wasn't like his top thing. So what he did instead was he made a profile where that was his top thing and that really played it up. So I can't decide if that was ethical or not personally. But what ended up happening was he would go on like, once he created these profiles, he got a bunch more interest from women because he had basically created five ideal men for the women that he was interested in. And then he started going on breakfast, lunch, coffee dates. And then about a month later, he met the woman he married. Wow. Yeah. So if you approach, so the, the idea for the book was born out of that whole idea, both my uh, fascination and disgust with how this man went about finding his partner. And again, I can't decide whether or not it's ethical <laughs> because he didn't lie. He just, you know, it's like when you go out for a date, you do your hair, but your hair doesn't always look like that, right? I don't know. It's a, it's an ethical conversation. So it, it's a conversation. So I took Matt and I, I loosely based his sense of morality on this mathematician's sense of morality in this kind of gray area uh, where this gentleman lived, but a very analytical approach to dating and love. And then I have Marie, that character who uh, is horrified by it. So uh, that was, and then I wanted to see what happened. And so that's how those characters were born was based on a nonfiction article where I was like, this is crazy. I got to write a book about this. So. Well, we're very glad you did. <laughs> Uh, but just a few more minutes, I was wondering if you could tell us um, maybe something you're reading or something that you would recommend for us to read. Uh, either one can go first. I just read uh, Amy Herman's um, What the Wind Knows, and uh, it's, based, it's about um, covered wagons going through the Oregon Trail and going from the east coast to the west coast and all the horrible dysentery it's like playing the game the Oregon Trail but it was fascinating and it was based on her own family's history her husband Amy Harmon's husband apparently a per the author note um, has some indigenous um, Native American people's uh, ancestry and then she herself had her own ancestors came over on the um, and covered wagons and so she blended those two histories and researched her ancestors and then ended up writing a book about it and that was wonderful and fascinating and harsh and uh just really it was really well done and she of course is a, an amazing inspiring author and person so i really enjoyed that that was fantastic thank you julia um so non-romance, a book that will not get out of my head, and it, this is probably not a good idea, um, it's Chuck Wendig's Wanderers, which is a pandemic book, but I tend to go into the fire when I'm, <laughs> so you just, I, that's the non, that it, it is powerful, right now might not be a good time. Um, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction, a lot of pol political nonfiction, and we just will not talk about that right now either. Uh, in terms of romance, I I have a couple of re strong recommendations um, that I've just been reading a lot of lately. So Melanie Harlow's Drive Me Wild was one of the best, funniest opening books, opening to a book I think I've read in a long Ooh, nice. time. And it's just like boom, 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 comfortable, funny, like you get a sense of the characters really quickly. And I just put like, boom, afternoon disappeared. Um, I'm also reading Blair Babylon's new series. It starts with One Night in Monaco, and it's mm. this, and her audio, speaking of um, full cast, it's like six different characters in the book, and each one is read by a different person. And so um, those are, those are two, two romance books that I've been reading recently, but, but yeah, uh, yeah, maybe Wanderers is for later, sorry. <laughs> Um, that's, I'm totally looking those books up <laughs> not the wanderers though. Um, so what's up next for you? What's the, what's the next book that will be coming out that we can look forward to? 
you want to go first? Do you want me to go first? I'm sorry. Go first, Julia. Okay. Um, I, I have Shopping for a CEO's Baby, uh, which is coming out October 27th. Andrew and Amanda are having twins. So it's Andrew and Amanda's turn in duplicate. And so that book is um, the 16th book in my Shopping for a Billionaire series. But there's two different couples in the series and it follows their arcs. But that's coming out and that's really exciting because they deserve to have all the fun that they have. And then after that, there's an unnamed shopping book coming out in December. And then all the crazy stuff that's half written. So I'm hoping I'm hoping to get some more more out. But those are the official definitely coming out. Um okay. So I definitely have uh, the next book in the Cletus and Jen Cozy Mysteries, which is Solving for Pie. Uh, <laughs> Cletus and Jen Cozy Mysteries. <laughs> you know, I cannot resist a pun. I just can't resist a pun. So when one of my readers suggested Solving for Pie being there, I was like, done and done. So <laughs> it's uh, Solving for Pie, Cletus and Jen. Um, and so that's Marriage and Murder. Um, so that's coming out in the beginning of March. Uh, but before that, because I started writing this kind of out off the wall idea, um, I, I think I might actually have a holiday release. I know, I've never written a holiday story before. Look at your face, I can see your That's face. Sweet. Um, cool. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to be writing a holiday story and it's a series because all my books are in series, but it would be a three book series. First one would come out probably in November, but don't take that as gospel because I haven't decided yet whether or not to do it. It's kind of like a fly by the seat of my pants kind of thing. Um, but it would be called the Three Kings series. So you see how that works with holiday? Okay, so the Three Kings series, and then um, the first book would be called Homecoming. The second book would be called Drama, and the third book would be called Throng because they'd be the homecoming king, the drama king, and the prom king. And so there you go. Wow. <laughs> wow, I'm back. <laughs> um, I am so excited about all of those, everything. Um, uh, yeah, I think we'll all be like, you know, busily like on your website <laughs> in the next few minutes. Um, I want to say thank you for being here and answering all of our questions and um, just being your amazing selves. And as um, somebody said on Facebook, um, you offer us, you know, a haven in difficult times. And um, we said this before, but it's true. It's absolutely true. When things are good, we like to read romance. When we, things are not so good, we depend on romance. So thank you so much. And um, I wanted to tell everybody who's here that um, this is, uh, we have a very uh, active romance book club at the Cary Library. And this was brought to us by the uh, Romance Book Club. This is when we would normally meet. Next month, we have a panel with, uh, that we're talking about why we read Bodice Rippers and why we liked them or, you know, in the era of Me Too. And so on that panel will be Sarah McLean. Falguni Katari, Carolyn, um, Caroline Linden, <laughs> Loretta Chase, and um, editor Lucia Macro. So we hope you can join us for that. I'll send out all that information in a recap of this. But, um, you know, this has been a pleasure. And I hope you guys had fun. And I hope yeah. everybody who came had a really great time. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you much. Thank you so much for having us. Well, I have not laughed that hard in, in quite a while, so thank you. <laughs> have a great rest of your evening. Yes, have a great evening, everybody. Thank, thank you so you much for being here. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everybody, on Facebook, too. We enjoyed having you here. <laughs>